Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament and Gospel readings deal with what are called epiphanies. That is, encounters between sinful human beings like us on one hand and God on the other. This is instructive for us who, in distinction from God's people of old, have the great good fortune and high and holy privilege of having an epiphany and encounter with God, not just on given occasions, but every time we attend to his word. Our Old Testament reading records the prophet Elijah's encounter with God on Mount Horeb, where he fled to escape the murderous clutches of Jezebel after doing away with her prophets in his showdown with them on Mount Carmel. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, Jezebel vowed in her blistering message to, to Elijah. Hers was no idle threat, Elijah well knew. So being terror stricken, he ran for his life. To say that he was crestfallen is to put the case too lightly. He despaired of life itself. Hopefully, should you or I encounter that depth of despair, we will recall Jesus' words on the subject. I tell you the truth, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Even more, fear him who has authority to raise the dead to life everlasting or to eternal damnation. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear him. Clearly, in this dark night of his soul, Elijah feared Jezebel more than he feared God or trusted in God to deliver him and faithfully fulfill his promises through him. Yet more than fear of Jezebel and failure to fear and trust in God motivated him. Elijah feared he was a failure himself, utterly defeated by God's enemies who had become his enemies in his service to God. And so in this dark night of his soul, in his headlong flight from Jezebel and his wholesale abandonment of his God-given commission, Elijah prayed to God that he might die, but die at God's hand, not Jezebel's. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. What about you and your dark night of the soul? Do you ever fear that your rivals are gaining the upper hand and that you are losing ground to them and losing face before them and before God? Have you ever felt like life is getting the best of you and God is letting you down and you wish you could die? How differently is this sentiment from that expressed in the hymn, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my life, Lord, and let it not be business as usual. We can empathize with Elijah, can't we? 
an increasing number of desperate people in our country, instead of pleading with God that they might fall into his most merciful hands, are not waiting for God, much less relying on his grace, but are ending their lives by their own hand. There has been a rash of these tragic occurrences lately. I read that there has been a 25% increase in the number of su suicides nationwide since 1999, as much as 30% in some states. Though we dare not condone the actions of these hopeless individuals, we can and do empathize with them and their loved ones. Take my life, Lord, and let it not be business as usual. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. The conclusion is inescapable. We can all use an epiphany of God in these gray and latter days. Elijah was about to encounter his on Mount Horeb, where besides fleeing to escape Jezebel, he might have figured that he was escaping his commission as well, or wished he was, like Jonah. We recall to what extremes God went at that time to put his prophet Jonah back on course and keep him on the right path clear to the end. Talk about divine epiphanies. So with Elijah, in lieu of facing his Waterloo, he faced his God instead. What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of the Lord came to him. Elijah fired I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, whereas the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Could the situation be any more desperate, any less hopeful? Besides being an indictment of the very people to whom God sent him to minister with his word, there is at least the implication that God had let them down, Elijah and his fellow prophets, and the people of Israel alike, all together. Or if he hadn't, where was he in all this upheaval? God doesn't leave Elijah in the lurch in the pit of his despair. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, he directs his servant. If Elijah had occasion to fear a wicked, murderous mortal like Jezebel, and he did, notwithstanding this, he had infinitely more occasion to fear the holy and almighty God. And God provided the occasion as he passed by. A great and strong wind that tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord and, and could have as easily torn Elijah to bits or you and me. And after the wind, an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. And though these manifestations were part of God's epiphany on behalf of Elijah, as awesome and fear-inspiring as they were, yet God was not in them, but in the still, small voice which followed them. The low and gentle whisper, the all-powerful word of God. And when Elijah heard it, for faith and godly fear come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Sinful humans exhibit a fearful reticence 
and avoidance in the presence of the all-knowing, all-holy, and almighty God. Beginning with Adam and Eve, our forerunners, when first they fell away from God into sin and foolishly tried to hide from him behind the trees in the garden, even as they tried in vain to hide their sin from him behind their flimsy aprons and flimsier excuses. And how often do not we, their descendants, join them in this tomfoolery? All to no avail. God finds us out. St. Peter displays this fearful reticence toward God and avoidance of him in our gospel reading with respect to the epiphany that occurred in connection with the miraculous catch of fish, where falling down at Jesus' knees, he blurted out, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. <laughs> and the yet greater epiphany to follow, do not be afraid, from now on, you will be catching men. And so they were in that gospel net provided by their Savior and ours, the Lord Jesus Christ. The same gospel net in use today, still catching men for the kingdom until that great fisher of men returns to gather us in. We do well to ponder this fruit born of God's epiphany. If Elijah tried to deflect God's overwhelming and omniscient scrutiny, or at least avert his own shamefacedness in light of it by covering his head with his cloak at God's still small voice, Isaiah, more taken aback still in the divine limelight, was both more direct and more forceful and a lot less evasive. Woe is me, I cried, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts indeed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our eyes have seen the King also. Before the same gracious God, we acknowledge, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. Even as we are heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and on the basis of his boundless mercy, for the sake of the Lamb of God, his dear Son, who has taken away the sins of the world, we appeal to him to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. If Isaiah's guilt was taken away and his sin atoned for at God's bidding and upon his word by means of, of a live coal taken from the altar with which the seraph purged his unclean mouth and lips, how much more is our guilt taken away and our sin atoned for by God's only begotten Son on account of his holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death on our behalf, specifically by purging us, not just our unclean mouth and lips, with his body and blood broken and shed for us and our sins on the cross and given us to eat and to drink for our forgiveness in his holy supper. Consider Job in this regard. Confronted with the same majestic presence in the face of his sinful folly, Job confessed. He did not rationalize, but confessed. Therefore, I despise myself 
and repent in dust and ashes. <laughs> well, he might so confess, for he had had an even greater epiphany of God, whereby he testified, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Like Job, we also know that our Redeemer lives. How our heart yearns within us as we long to see him in the blessed fellowship of all the saints with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven in our flesh, with our own eyes, face to face, when again he will stand upon the earth in the end of days and we with him to sing our praises to him better than we are now able. How fortunate we are, how privileged to share such an epiphany, such a gracious encounter with our God, not only on given occasions, but every time we attend to his word, as we do today, and as we sing, I know that my Redeemer lives, what comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives who once was dead. He lives my everlasting head. Oh, the sweet joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.